Nimang hao. Namaste. Good morning to all of you. I am extremely delighted to be addressing you this morning. Particularly the audience, which is so brilliant, consisting of young minds, business people, academicians, policy makers. And I also would like to particularly thank young scientists entering National Energy Group who invited me here. I also would like to thank New Scientist Forum and the Beijing Low Carbon Clean Energy Research Institute who have been doing the maximum and very hard work to make sure that the energy transformation to the low carbon economy goes ahead successfully. I was here about six months back and I had seen this enthusiasm that time as well. But there is a difference. And the difference is how the climate is changing around us. Climate change is running faster than what China can think of. It is running faster than what the technology transformation is taking place. And that is really a worrisome fact. After my last visit to China, COP28 conference of parties took place in Abu Dhabi. And there was a tremendous amount of energy to understand the issue and also to take the pledges which are much higher than what we thought before. For example, one of the pledges taken and the decision made by all the countries who participated in COP28 was to double the energy efficiency from what we have today by 2030 and also tripling the renewable energy starting from today till 2030. It is really a challenging job. There are two more other challenges which are related to the reducing the concentration of methane along with carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And there is another one challenge which is related to what is called as financing. It's not only the financing to the developing countries, but it is also the financing all over the world to get the transformation of the energy sources from the present dirty source to the clean source. There is also the issue of how we work together. China is working probably in a silos. India is working in silos. European Union, USA, Japan. And yes, there are platforms like G7, G20. There are other alliances like International Solar Alliance. But we don't see the impact of this alliance yet. And we require different kind of partnerships in order to get to the challenge. Since my last visit to China, there is a one more event that has taken place. And that is the release of status of global climate issued by World Meteorological Organization. That has come about one week back. It was released on 19th March. And it had a sort of a startling revelations. It said that we are definitely going to fail the target of 1.5 degrees centigrade rise of temperature of the earth above the pre-industrial level. At present, we are somewhere around 1.47 degrees centigrade rise. There is also plus and minus 0.15 temperature range in a modeling, which means that we almost failed to keep our promises which we gave in 2015 during the Paris Climate Agreement. Whether it is a rising temperature, whether it is related to the droughts, the extreme events in terms of their frequency and their intensity, it is also related to how much ice from Antarctica is melting, 
how many glaciers are melting and they are also breaking the records. We indeed are in a situation where the World War III has started. Many say that United Nations is created to stop the World War III because it was created after that World War II. But that World War III now will not be between the nations. It will be between the humanity and the nature. And that World War III is already on. What we do? How we go from here? Antonio Guterres, who is a United Nations Secretary General, he has termed that we are at the point where we are handling triple crisis. And I personally called it A, B, C. The A is air pollution. B is biodiversity loss and the C is the climate change. And let me tell you, all these three crises are interrelated. Some say climate change is the source of biodiversity loss. Climate change is the source of air pollution. Many say that due to the air pollution, biodiversity loss is taking place. But without going into these interlinkages, let me also see the result of this, result of this is about what is called as the planetary crisis. We are crossing the boundaries of all this crisis and we are keeping earth in imbalance. Earth is no more in balance. The nature have balancing cycles. There is a nitrogen cycle, there is a carbon cycle. There is a water cycle, but today humanity and its developmental processes are breaking each and every of these cycles. Where we go from here? The COP28 has made a decision that we have to transition away from fossil fuel. And there is an interesting term which is used and it is called as a just transition. It is not just a transition, but it is a just transition. And that word just is connected to the social justice. When we take a transition away from the fossil fuel, away from the dirty energy sources to the clean energy sources, we should have a social justice. This is a very important decision. According to me, it is one of the most important decisions that Dubai COP28 has made. We need a clean energy, the energy produced by non-fossil fuel. We luckily have a number of options. And with our determination, with our skills and the young minds, we already made a good progress. And these progress have been made in terms of solar energy, wind energy, biofuels, nuclear energy, hydro power and also now we are talking about hydrogen energy. All these clean energy sources have seen a rapid rise. But along with this rapid rise, I think there is a rapid worry. And there is also rise of risks that is hidden. And I would like to point out that. But I'm pointing it out not to discourage the young people, but to reorient their mind so that they look at the right aim and objective. Let's take solar energy. Now, today, while solar energy is spreading faster, in fact, 2023 saw 50% rise in the capacity of solar energy as compared to 2022. And the China had taken a major part of it. In fact, whatever is the increase in solar capacity in all over the world, equivalent of that China has done it in just one year between 22 and 23. But at the same time, there is a one issue which is coming up is the disposal of solar panels. And we have not handled it. 
Similarly, we have a issue about the batteries from the electrical vehicles. Again, China has made a great, great stride in electrical vehicles. The electrical vehicle rate of production and its business and its utilization is one of the highest in China. But what about the disposal of these batteries of electrical vehicles? How to extract lithium? How to recycle it? In fact, let me tell you, the history of technology has taught us that every technology has its own background, has its own dump yard, own garbage, and we need to take care of that garbage. That technology garbage, once we start attacking it, once we, we start addressing it, then frankly, our problem gets solved. And that's where we come, what is called as a young minds, the youth, the youth in university, and those youth in university are the future to guide us to solve this formidable problem. They need to hold their hands, develop a partnership. As I said in the beginning, we are far from our targets. We are slow in our target, reaching the targets. And we also work in silos. And that silos, we have to break it. We have to bring the universities and the students between the age of 18 and 24, which is considered to be the most productive age, most productive age for innovation and the research, and the most productive age for finding the alternative energy sources need to be utilized in a partnership. What does partnership do? Partnership accelerates the progress. Partnership make sure that we are not neglecting one particular area which will become a troublesome later on and we have to give up that kind of a technology. And we have the examples in the past when a partnership takes place, the solutions to the global problems get accelerated. There is a one example. It's not a very good example, probably bad example, but the lesson is good. When an atom bomb is to be dropped or to be developed, to be dropped to end World War II, there was a network of research institutes formed in Europe and North America. And that accelerated the progress. After all, that bomb didn't do a good thing. They devastated one country. But it's an example that how we can accelerate when we are facing with the global problem. My proposed proposition is that let's form the partnership. Let's form the partnership of the universities in research for the clean energy. And when we say research of the clean energy is not just production of clean energy, but trying to see what are its side effects. And those are the important ones. Today we are, we are not considering the side effects. And we are going ahead with just technology development without looking back what will be the bad impacts of that technology. As we know, every technology is like a double-edged double sword. It can cut both ways, good as well as bad. And that's why my organization, Green Ter Foundation in India, has been working globally with all the global universities to work together to solve the climate change issue. And we have what is called as a, a network of the universities. And that global network has institutes in China as well. The Beijing University is part of this network. And the other universities are joining. And we call it a smart campus cloud network. Smart because we want to use the digital technologies. And the campus is a living laboratory. And we have a cloud which is to share the information. And the, finally, the network is for the partnership. So such kind of smart campus cloud network can be addressing such issues and going ahead with it. Today, we have to leave behind the small diplomatic problems. The sharing the borders, the sharing the water, sharing the natural resources. I think that should be left behind 
and we should progress towards sharing the knowledge, sharing the technologies, sharing the insights and sharing the understanding of the side effects in order to progress and address this climate change. Thank you very much. Shishik.